What's up, everyone? This is Christian Duke. This week in bodybuilding, episode three, brought to you courtesy of Muscle Gels, topical muscle enhancement gels available at musclegels.com. I'm going to go ahead and show you some of our great products. We have Andro Hard. This is the product that got it all started. Then we have Andro Shred. This one's great for fat loss. Believe me, I need it. I'm using it. And finally, we've got Gear. Brand new, brand spanking new. Check out all three products at the Muscle Gels booth at the 2018 Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio. We will be there. I will be there. Greg the Ramblin' Freak Valentino will be there. Big Frank will be there. All six foot four, 370 pounds of muscle. Big Frank Budaleski will be there. So today is a really, really special episode for me because we're going to have Jerry Ward on. Mr. BioS3 Training will be joining us. And I think that's really awesome. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Jerry, you probably live under a rock because Jerry is someone that, for one, is always doing live casts. Okay, I see him. He's on his way to the gym. If he has time, he'll pull over in his car. He'll do a live cast. He'll answer questions. He'll take the time to really talk to people about training, about supplements. What's up, Comerica Muscle? What's up, Wise Carver Kevin? Uh, what's up, uh, Blackstone Ball? <laughs> Blackstone Baller. That's a pretty cool name. And Jerry's here. So, um, so as I was saying, he will always stop and take the time to do Instagram lives, answer questions. I've seen him do it a million times. He's answered several of my questions. He has been training people for over a quarter of a century. Can you believe that? Over a quarter of a century, worked with multiple companies, never left on a bad note, always positive, always giving back to the community. So again, uh, I would like to welcome Jerry, and I'm going to bring him in here. I think he's joining us shortly here. And the big thing about Instagram Live is not interrupting. See, when he comes on, oh, there he is. There we go. Oh, cool. Jerry, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. It's my first time doing this double Instagram live thing. Very cool, man. Well, this is my third time, but I'm no expert. So there we go. So as I was telling people, yeah, I, first of all, thank you so much for doing this because, first of all, I have a very, very small Instagram, so like 2,500, very small. But uh, I love to do interviews and I love to uh, talk to people that are really helping shape the industry the right way. And yeah. I think a lot can be said with that, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, well, I appreciate one, you having me on, man. Like, I, you know, I, if the thing is, Going way back, like, you're like, I only have 2,500. I don't care how many followers someone has. I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Like, I love this stuff. I've been doing it for, like you said, you know, over a quarter of a century. Like, I'm just happy to be involved with it. Like, you know, I'm living my best life just doing all of this stuff. So I'm happy to do it. And great haircut, too, by the way. I love the haircut. <laughs> That's the mock three right there. <laughs> but, yeah. So one of the reasons that I really want to have you on, I don't know if uh, folks are aware or not, but uh, you're no longer with uh, Primeval Labs. Um, you're yeah. starting your own company, which I think is really, really interesting. And I think, I think it's it's a it's a gutsy move, you know, because honestly, I think it'd be easier to stay with another company, have your own line with them. You know, it's safer. This is definitely, I think, you know, very gutsy. But I think if anyone can do it, it's you. So before we talk about that, talk to us about natural supplementation. What what all can be done? Because I think a lot of people are kind of tired of seeing the same creatine pre workout. That and, and I think that a lot can be done with natural supplements, uh, and I think it blow people's minds. Absolutely, um, and, you know the natural supplement thing for me started when I was about 15 years old. There was a company called Daniel Chapter One, and they had their own program. It wasn't like um, a mainstream thing. It was for athletes, and like some of the wrestlers on the wrestling team used it, and the whole Bristol High School used it. And my cousin was on it, and everybody had accused my cousin of being on steroids. He was like 113 pounds, and he would drop to 93 pounds to wrestle. So I'm like, there's no way he's on drugs, but he was so strong. So I just finally said, you know, I bit the bullet and I didn't have any money or anything, but I went into the store and said, you know, I want to know about your program. Well, they had meal replacements. They had, you know, pre-workouts that weren't like what we have nowadays, but they had something called pre-post. So you take it before and after your workout. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I really started realizing that, you know, there were holes missing in nutritional um, programs that a lot of, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you're busy, you're a kid, you're a teenager or whatever. And these things were filling those holes and getting the people faster results. So it was only a matter of time before I started with their program. And I mean, I was, you know, at 19 years old, I was 205 pounds already. I was benching the 110s for reps. I mean, I was a big, strong kid naturally. And it was on that program using the supplements. So I knew from a young age that supplements, they do work. They do help. They do get you there faster. And eventually what wound up happening was I was so into it and interested in it, 
I wound up working at the company, which was my first real introduction to how um, these things work and how your body would get better results and faster results using supplements. And, and I think, you know, one of the things too, and, you know, with the Planet Fitnesses, the Retro Fitnesses, I mean, a lot of these discount gyms where you basically, you get the keys to the kingdom for nine ninety nine. okay? Uh, I think people are going to Walmart also and they're seeing supplements, you know, cheaper and cheaper, even some of the big name brands. And my thought on the matter is if some of these companies have giant boots at the Arnold's, they're signing big stars. They're having amazing branding and packaging. Something's got to give. I mean, you know, they're making money. And I'm guessing that for the prices they're charging, you know, something is not right. So I'm assuming yeah. that, you know, the, I think the the more uh, serious lifter, more serious competitor is willing to pay a little bit extra to make sure they're getting quality supplements as opposed to paying bottom barrel prices and getting who knows yeah. what. I mean, you know, some of these companies, and, um, you know, I really don't care, like, who gets yeah. mad, who does it. You know, they're charging these premium prices, and I'm, you know, involved with the making of the supplements and stuff. Even with Prime Evil, I was helping them formulate. I know what stuff costs, and I know what they're charging. You know what I mean? So I know that some of these companies, they're making a lot of profit and ripping people off hands down for what they're paying for them. But mm -hmm. I also know that a lot of these companies that you think are doing well and are big are absolutely almost fucking bankrupt. Like, they're on the, the borderline of being completely bankrupt signing people with these big amounts almost every single time you get one of these boots at an expo it's a loss like you're not there to make money it's for brand awareness now some of these boots are up to thirty thousand dollars at the olympia now there's no way they're recouping that on top of you know the other things that they're paying athletes and stuff like that flying them out and stuff these companies are losing major amounts of money and I, i'm not really sure the the process the thinking of it but i think what it is is they want to look cool they want to yeah. be the cool dogs on the block they want to be Rich Piana, okay? That's basically what they want to be. They want everybody to look at them and follow them and think they're so cool, and they're building this image, whereas that just was really rich. You know what I mean? He had the money. He had the style. He had everything that was just made him him, and they look at it as like, well, I got to show that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm spending like, you know, $80,000 over here for this, and I got to buy a $2 million car, and this is my $4 million house that we built, and it's like, but you literally are almost bankrupt doing what you're doing. And they, you know, some of these companies, they take out more loans, they go in debt to the, the manufacturers. And then next thing you know, they wind up, you know, you think that it's their company, but it's not their company anymore. Someone else has bought it and they're still the face of the company, but they're practically bankrupt. So, I mean, it's just like any other industry. There's a lot of bullshit, a lot of shadiness. You know, for myself, I have zero overhead. I don't have any employees. I don't have anything except myself. So therefore, I'll be able to bring these things to market a lot cheaper and more affordable than some of these other companies that have to pay somebody ten grand a month for their contract, pay for their three million dollar house, pay for all their employees that are doing the shipping. You know, they technically have to charge more to be able to get the products to you. The bigger the company is, but at the same time, like there's still a limit to where if they're producing a product for five dollars, they're charging seventy five dollars for it. Like, come on, you know? Yeah, and and I have to say, when you first said thirty thousand, I was like, well. And you said 80. I had a friend, uh, I don't, you know, had a friend over 5%. I won't say what year, but uh, I heard something like 100,000. I mean, some of these boots were... Yeah, like, well, because you had a giant booth. The more the more pieces that you buy to the booth. So if you have a single booth, it could be anywhere from three to $5,000 at like a regular expo. When you hit the Olympia, the bigger the booth, obviously, the more you pay, but you also pay for advertising as well. So if you pay 15000 for your booth, you pay 15000 for advertising through the Olympia also. It almost right. doubles what you're you're paying. So Rich had like five or six boots together. You know what I mean? So you're looking at thirty thousand times three or whatever it is. And that's where the hundred thousand comes from. And you know, yeah. it really was about. I mean, they honestly they never broke even on those things. You know, there's no way you're making a hundred thousand dollars profit. You know, on top of you know what you're spending at the Olympia. So it's all about brand awareness. And we've seen a lot of companies like um, um, Alpha Leap who decided not to do them anymore. Because they were like, it just doesn't make any sense. They can literally go to an event like um, Christian Guzman. I don't know if you know who he is. But he can literally go to say, all right, I'm going to be in Texas at this gym on this date. And they can get literally 2,000 people to show up just to see him there without spending $30,000 on a booth. You know what I mean? So some of the companies are getting smart, realizing they don't need the expos anymore. They have the following. And they're bringing the following, just like Rich Bianca did, to the expos. But if they go somewhere else, the people are going to go too. So it's like their their loyal um, followers are going to follow them no matter where they go. They don't need the expos anymore. So you're seeing people start to go, I'm not spending thirty grand anymore. You know what I mean? I'll I'll just do this on my own instead. 
get 2,000 people to show up. They're all my followers. We get to mingle and stuff. It doesn't cost me 30 grand. Yeah, my thing is a little different, but but similar. I think that, you know, the brand awareness is important, and I think you could, like, really, you know, follow goodwill at the Arnold and the Mr. Olympia. But I think you have to really diversify. I know this, it's a big word like gymnasium, but you have to really diversify, you know, how you spend your marketing. And, and yeah, like, again, if you're just doing it for – the bells and whistles. I mean, I, I know people, sadly, that, you know, drive a Beamer and don't have a pot to piss in. You know I mean? They have a Beamer, but, like, they have a problem. You know, so what good is that? Um, you know, and I, I think appearances, yeah, unfortunately, you know, you, you should only spend what you have. And then some of these companies, they have to take out, you know, extended and, and additional lines of credit. And, I mean, at the end of the day, it should really be about the products, not about, you know, the bells and whistles. So, um, you had IntraCell with Primeval, which was a huge hit. Talk to us about uh, the new company. Like, you know, I don't know if you're at liberty to get to say what products you're going to have, but but talk to us about how the new company came about. Like, why did you decide now to do it? And and again, uh, talk a little bit about starting out just on your own instead of having a massive staff, which you could easily have. But I, I like the fact that you're being very pragmatic and and starting out slowly. Well, I kind of want to do it myself. And this all started, like, when I signed with Primeval, I was with Rich Piana. And um, the discussion I had with him about going to Primeval, he said, why don't you just not go with them and just do it yourself? And he's like, I'll help you set it up. I'll explain everything, how it works. He's like, just do your own brand. Like, you have enough to do it. And that was a few years ago, which I really didn't have the confidence to launch my own brand. And, I mean, I'll be honest with you, you know, like, being the face of Primeval, what we did before we got the other athletes really made me confident saying, wait a minute, there were people that really were paying attention to me because – you know, I sit here and I make my videos, I go train my clients, I hang out with my wife. You don't see the impact that it has until you get to an expo. When you go to an expo and people start lining up to talk to you and shake your hand and stuff, that's when you realize, like, your reach is a lot further than just, you know, Fairfax, Virginia, where I live. So it, it kind of was in my head back then. And Primeval had grown to the point where they got so big and they started taking on other athletes. I was getting paid a certain amount that I felt like I should be doing more work for. You know, and I went to Primeval and said, you know, let me do this, let me do that, let me just, let me do more work. And they were so cool about being like, no, you're the face. We just want you to be the face. Just do what you do. We don't want any extra out of you. Just, you know, just do what you do. And I kind of stepped back a couple of times. It was like they could take that money and reinvest what they're paying me into the company and do something else with it would make a lot more sense. So when it came down to brass tax, it was like, well, I can't go any higher in the company unless I buy into it. And even that, it's like I'm buying into a company that, you know, I would have to put forth a big investment. It would take me a while to get that investment back. And then you're involved with partners, which a lot of partners don't work out too well. And I was like, I have these ideas, but I don't want to be like, hey, I have this idea and have my partner shoot it down because he doesn't like it. I was like, right. you know what? I think it's just time for me to do it myself. Everything is me. It's my concepts. It's my ideas. It's everything that, you know, I've always wanted that, you know, I can put forth now. And I'm in the financial situation to be an investor and not need a loan or anything like that. So I'll be the only investor, the only owner, the only customer service person. You know, when we start shipping, I'll be shipping from my garage right downstairs here. Everything will be done by hand by me. And I wanted to start at the bottom. You know what I mean? Like literally be packing the boxes myself, doing the slips, like learning every piece of that business before we take it. You know, you know, hopefully it becomes something bigger than, you know, just an at home thing. If it doesn't, I'm cool with that, too. But um, and I believe if you're going to be successful, you need to start absolutely at the bottom. And that's where I've always begun. And this is a new venture. And there's no way that I could just jump into it running. I need to learn how to walk first. And that's sure. where we're at. Talk to me a little bit or talk to us. And get, by the way, guys, I see there's a, a gajillion questions. And we're going to try to answer some of those at the end, but I don't have Jerry for very long. We don't have Jerry for very long. So I just have these four main questions. And then after that, we'll answer because I don't want to, you know, hog the guest. But um, one thing that I think that you really set a very positive example for in the industry is the fact that I know you got started out, I think, back in 2013 with other companies. But in particular, with 5% and with Primeval Labs, the way that you left, I mean, you gave notice, you left on good terms. You, you still keep it positive, you still plug them. Uh, how important is that? How important is to maintain those relationships even as you move on to new business ventures? Well, you know, I don't know, um, you know, what the average viewer age is out there that you have, but I'm 42 years old now. And over the years, the things that I actually appreciate and I feel like are the biggest things are the relationships with people in general. So I have, you know, you know friends, acquaintances, whatever, but the people that are, you know, truly in my inner circle, they're in my inner circle and they're there for a reason. And the guys that own Primeval are in there, you know, Rich Piano is in there. Like, they're legitimately my friends. Like, meaning if they called me, I would do whatever I had to do to help them. And that doesn't change because of the business decision. You know, like, 
Primeval is a business, but the owners are my friends. You know, 5% was a business, but Rich was my friend. So for me, it's important to keep those relationships, not really for business-wise, because, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I never went back to 5%, and, you know, there's no plans on going back to Primeval or anything like that, like leaving the doors open. But the thing is, you know, when you have these relationships that you deem important to you, then you work on it. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't want to be like, you know, why, why would I be mad at Primeval? They, they didn't kick me out. They didn't force me out. They didn't say anything to me. It was my decision to go. So, you know, having bad blood towards them or Rich Piana, like, makes no sense, you know? So that's kind of where I'm at in my life in general. Like, the people around me, I keep the people around me that I want around me. The people that I don't, I just kind of push them out of the way and leave it at that. But, like, you know, relationships are probably the most important thing to me now at this age. Awesome. And speaking of friends, I mean, Greg the Rambling Freak Valentino, always talking about <laughs> how you guys are real friends and your girlfriends are real friends. And that's really important. And uh, my friend Gary Udit, uh, I was going to yep. be doing this. wanted to send his absolute best to you. We're doing uh, Mid-Atlantic Muscle. And I saw you follow those. It's just awesome that you follow that. Thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, we're covering the Mid-Atlantic MPC. But, you know, you know, Gary just had to uh, make sure that I told you that. And Greg Valentino always mentions you. And, you know, I know that... Uh, before, uh, I think, you know, because of the I think contractual stuff, but maybe in the future, you know, you guys can do an interview. I think that interview would just be a blockbuster yeah. interview. Um, I'm free to do whatever now, but, like, um, so Greg and I have been friends for a while. Like, we're, we're pretty good friends. If we get on the phone, we're on the phone for, like, four or five hours. Like, we just, it's hard to get us on the phone. And Gary, I mean, Gary has been really pivotal in me becoming an NPC judge now um, and taking my posing. When, when I was doing physique, I started physique. Gary was the one that took me aside first. It was like, if you're going to do this, like, I think you fit better in physique than bodybuilding. But if you're going to do this, you have to adjust the posing. Like, you have to learn how to do these. And, um, you know, he didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? He literally, there's all these athletes all the way around everywhere. And he literally just took me aside. And there's actually a picture of me, I think, on my Instagram because J.M. Manion took the picture um, of him teaching me how to pose at one of the shows that I was at because I wasn't doing it right. You know, and it shows that he's really got a passion for the sport and he's interested and he wants to help people like, you know, he had no reason to help me, and he did. And, you know, I always appreciate that from him. And huge respect for him. He's just a great guy all the way around. Awesome. Two more questions, quick. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting, anybody following you on Instagram knows that, you know, uh, in terms of the new company uh, with the Arnold Classic, you, you were telling people that you had no intention of actually going to the Arnold because you weren't going to have a booth. And yeah. ever since I've been going to the Arnold, you've had a booth. And I, I think the, the, the response was so overwhelming to, to, to see you that you've actually decided to go. So talk a little yeah. bit about that response, because that, that was pretty powerful. Well, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't planning on leaving Primeval. It wasn't like there was a plan in the works, or it was, you know, this is what I'm going to be doing. So for the last six months, people are like, oh, you're going to the Arnold? And I'm like, yeah, of course, we're going to the Arnold. You know, we were planning to go into the UK with um, A-list supplements, um, you know, and then the Olympia, the Europas. We were supposed to do all these things. And then when I realized people actually took the day off, like they already scheduled days off from work, or they already cleared it with their wife and they got babysitters and stuff. Like they've already made adjustments in their lives literally to come see me. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, how can I do that to them? Like, even if I got to pay out of my own pocket and take care of everything myself, you know, I think it's important just to get there and see the people that are supporting you, you know? So that's when I kind of stepped back and I talked to my wife and said, look, you know, we just got to go. Like, we're just going to go. We're going to hang out. We'll walk around. Like, you know, I enjoy meeting people, you know, like I have a great time doing the expos and stuff, but, um, you know, it really kind of hit me because, again, you don't see your reach when you're sitting home making videos and doing Instagram or whatever. You don't see that people really care. You know, like you just kind of like do your thing. But when you get, you know, people commenting or like I had people come to see me from um, the Middle East. They flew into the L.A. Fit Expo a few years. They landed, came to the expo, got the pictures with me and an autograph, and they were getting back on a plane in a few hours to fly back. And that's when I was like, well, you know, you better take some time to talk to these guys. You know, they came halfway around the world to take a picture with you, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm just I'm super blessed and grateful for the people that are supporting me. And um, I just felt like if I didn't go, I'd be kind of turning my back on them and kind of screwing them over since they already went out of their way to make plans to come by and see us. So. And I think, you know, something, again, that you said on one of your videos, but, you know, again, I think it's, it's really uh, bringing up is that you want people to approach you. Like, you don't want them to say, you know, uh, uh, if you're not busy or I don't want to bother you. Like, you, you want that interaction. I think that's that's yeah. also real. Yeah, it doesn't matter where I am, if I'm at the gym, if I'm at dinner, it doesn't matter. Like, I've had people say, you know, they write on my Instagram, I saw you at the gym, I don't want to bother you because, you know, you had your headphones on, or I saw you and your wife out, or, like, at the mall, like, you walked by, and I'm like, we're not doing anything. Like, you know, you, you, I, I fully understand that they're 
giving me the respect of having my own space. Like they don't want to crowd you and bother you on your own time. But at the same time, I'm also aware that I'm in a position where I'm truly fortunate to have people even want to know what the hell I'm doing. You know what I mean? So it's like, if they're taking the time to sit there and go, is that Jerry? And they're even thinking about, should I go talk to him? Like they're taking time out of their day already even thinking about coming to talk to me. Like, yeah, I want to talk to you. Like if that's, you know, you just approach me. Like it doesn't bother me at all. And the last question that I have uh, involves contest prep, uh, personal training, transformations, all that fun stuff. Again, you have been training folks for 25 years. You have BioS3Training.com. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, I guess, without being, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative, but it just, there seems to be like a, like a prep coach, like all over the place. Somebody does one right. show, all of a sudden they're an authority. And I, I'm hearing more and more. I heard a little bit about it about five years ago, but I'm hearing more and more about metabolic damage. Because a lot of people are, you know, following, you know, programs to the T from people that don't know if they're on foot or horseback when it comes to prep. So uh, are you taking any clients and what can you tell folks out there if they're looking for a prep coach? So I'm doing online clients, in-person clients I'm not really taking on right now. But on client clients, it allows me to open it up to people all over the world, which um, I think is just cool with the online thing that, you know, you can talk to someone, you know, in Japan and get them in shape in Japan while, you know, like 20 years ago you couldn't do that. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, the whole prep thing, I think people realize that, um, you know, as a trainer, let's say you do an in-gym training, you get $65, $75, $100 an hour. They're like, these people are making what doctors are making. They didn't even have to go through 10 years of school. Like, I want to do that. So what they do is they start, like, DM me for programs or whatever. They start, like, you know, like, little Instagram stuff trying to promote their stuff. But here's the thing. Like, those people very quickly will be weeded out. They're not going to be there a year from now, a year and a half from now, two years because they don't really do it for the right reasons. They're not learning about it themselves. They don't know all the answers. Now, maybe nobody knows all the answers, but nine out of 10 times, I've already seen something that somebody's going through because of the fact that I've been doing it for 25 years. You know, these guys that do it for six months and all of a sudden they're a coach, they haven't seen anything. So they really don't know what to do. So they're just kind of flying by the seat of their pants and eventually word either gets around or they just get fed up with the headaches because prepping people for shows is stressful. Like you get those calls and those text messages and stuff like, people freaking out because they woke up and they were two pounds lighter or three pounds heavier or like just something random on their mind. Like, you know, it takes a, um, a very specific type of person to deal with people when they're starving themselves, getting ready for a show. And, um, you know, I just kind of deal with it because, or look at it like I've been doing it since I was a teenager. Like I love that whole process. And I had people around me that there was no internet, but we had the, the people that mentored me and people that were coaching me that were there for me nonstop. Like Kevin Lavroni is a good example. Like, you know, he was my coach in 2009. He's one of my closest friends, but he literally went to the gym with me every day. He called me to make sure I got up on time, made sure I was doing my cardio. Then the day of the show, the Pittsburgh, we drove Friday, me, him, and our other friend, Rick, we drove to Pittsburgh together. We, you know, we, he showed me how to dry out overnight like he did for the Olympia. We did an overnight dry out. Like, you know, it was the best physique to that point I'd ever brought. But like, mm -hmm. you know, having that person be there and cover all the bases for you, like really takes the pressure off you as an athlete. And that's my goal is to cover all the bases for these people so that they don't really have to deal with, you know, I, I don't mind the questions and stuff, but like a lot of people, they just, they just want to follow. They don't really want to know what they're doing. They just like, tell me what to do and I'll do it because they get so fed up with trying to figure out, you know, the combinations of things to do and why something's not working. They'd rather just, you know, pay someone. And I've done that myself in the past with, you know, Kevin trained me, Phil Hernan, Brad Hollibaugh. And I've worked with some pretty good coaches that, you know, I was just like, I don't want to do it myself. You know what I mean? I don't want to think. I just want to be told what to do. And, um, you know, for me, that's the best way to get through a prep. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of people out there that don't know what the hell they're doing. But um, I just sit back and let, like what I say, let the trash take itself out. You know, eventually they weed themselves out and then they're gone. And, you know, the people that have stood the test of time of 10, 15, 20, 30 years in the industry are still the ones there doing the training, getting results, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, guys, if you have any questions, please uh, put a few down there. Uh, and, and just the last thing on that thing, too, I, I've heard this from a lot of folks. I don't know if you would agree or not. Is it true that, that female clients getting ready for shows, like, basically follow programs to the T and the guys sometimes double get? Is that your experience or are the women well, more? I'd say, <laughs> I'd say the female clients for shows and guys, I mean, it's very similar. They all want to do all well the show. However, a female client getting ready for a wedding will literally eat dirt six times a day if you tell her to do it. She'll sleep standing up if you tell her. It does not matter what you tell her to do. The wedding is the most motivating thing to any end of guys, not so much. They'll put on a tux, but that wedding photo of the woman in her dress, they will go to any length 
to get to where they need to be. And like, you know, I've watched it year after year and I'm like, man, these brides put some of these bodybuilders to shame, you know, it's how, how hard they work. Mm. Just a little bit of pressure, I guess. Right. Just a little. <laughs> well, pictures are forever. So. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I think that the questions uh, dried up a little bit. There's a lot of questions at the beginning, but I just, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't uh, uh, answer, have uh, those questions just yet. But, um, uh, where can uh, so find me? I, here. So this Big Frank, Big Frank's on here, but this guy just asked the new product. Can you actually replace meals with it instead of six times a day, eat three times a day with the product? Oh, it's Comerica Muscle. It's Dave, right? I didn't even see the name on cool. it. But yes, one of the things that I wanted to do, Dave, was um, I wanted to produce a product that would cost less than a meal. So if you guys are seeing some of the stuff I put out, it says you just lost your last excuse. That last excuse is when the people go, well, just eat food. It's cheaper just to eat food. Like, that's the one thing that most people can't argue with. They're like, well, yeah, I guess it's cheaper just to eat a meal. Well, what if you had an in completely nutritious amino acids, carbohydrates, plus things to blunt cortisol, improve protein digestion and protein synthesis, and it was less than $1.99 per serving? Like, you can't even find a meal, even if you went to Costco, bought everything, made it yourself. You couldn't get the same amount of macros and stuff in this for less than $1.99 anywhere. So the idea was to get something that will replace meals, but... Much like when I was younger, I would buy the protein powders and stuff that were half off because they were expired because I couldn't afford to buy the food. So buying the supplements at half off actually helped me get through some hard times financially. And I'm like, if I could put out this product that actually someone's like, look, if I take, you know, five servings of this a week, that saves me five meals that I can take that money and put it into my business, into my wife, into my kids or whatever that was another direction that I wanted to go into. It was in, because again, I had no overhead. I can do stuff like that. And it's interesting too, because I think that was a great question too by Dave. I just, I'm like Greg, you know, when these things start, you know, flying, I can't read them that quick, but I think also with a product like yours, the ratios are there also, because even though you could save money on food, you, you wouldn't know the, the appropriate macro ratios that are going to work to building muscle and, and, and hopefully keeping you from, you know, getting fat. I actually have to lose quite a bit of weight, so I might be buying those products very shortly, too. Um, very what good. else? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, people are like, why are you doing bodybuilding interviews? You're fat. Well, I'm, I am fat, but I love bodybuilding. So in my heart, I'm a bodybuilder, even though I'm, you know, a chubby bunny or whatever. Being you a bodybuilder is not about how lean you are. You know, being a bodybuilder is getting up and trying to improve yourself every day and be better sure. than you were the day before. You know, being a competitive bodybuilder, that's yeah. something different, you know. But, I mean, to be a bodybuilder, you get up in the morning and you train. You get up tomorrow morning and train, you get up the next day and you train, you're a bodybuilder. You know, you're building your physique. You're trying to be better than you were the day before. And I think that, um, you know, some of the competitive bodybuilders may look down on the people that are just doing bodybuilding. You know, maybe the people that are just doing bodybuilding look up to the competitive bodybuilders. But bottom line is, you know, anybody that's out there trying to improve themselves, like I don't see why anybody would be messing with them talking shit. Sure. Your buddy Greg wants to know when, when he's going to be an uncle. Greg. <laughs> well, we got a dog, so he's already an uncle. He's an uncle to Brady. <laughs> there you go and actually speaking of greg he's going to be doing an instagram live tonight 9 p.m eastern standard time at iron mag labs with tiger fitness mark lobliner that's going to be very very interesting and mark was very excited that we were doing this too he like left a comment i spoke to him earlier today so he's an interesting yeah, guy a good dude. He's, mark actually got me um kind of in with the first company so i was with big bitch formula originally which was a local company and then when i went to an expo mark was there with isatori and I had never mm. met him. He recognized me, and we started talking because I guess he had seen my channel. And um, that's when I tried BioGro for the first time. And after I tried it, I called, I contacted him through email, and he directed me direct to the uh, Isatori um, CEO, Stephen Adelaide, immediately. And that's how I wound up getting in with Isatori to begin with. So Mark was very pivotal in the beginning when I was doing the YouTube thing towards getting me towards um, into some of the supplement companies and stuff like that. And that's another great company, too. I mean, like, again, uh, you get what you pay for, you know what I mean? And, you know, I, I just can't get over, I'm not going to say names or anything, but I just can't get over how some companies are selling products as cheap as they are, uh, you know, because what that does, you know, people start to expect that from all the other companies. And, you know, right. like Frank, that big Frank said earlier, you get what you pay for, you know. And, and the reason, yeah. one of the things about Mark that I find, I told him, I, even today I said, like, it, it was hilarious. I don't know if you saw those ridiculous videos he was doing, kind of like, uh, he was making a little bit of fun of Brad Castleberry, but, I mean, he was, like, doing back, uh, he had, like, a like a, a box in his backyard, and he jumped on it, it was, like, six inches off the floor. He's like, a record, you know, he's, like, hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, he's just a funny guy. 
like on Goodfellas, you know, funny guy. I, I don't know. Uh, what does Frank say? Any other questions, guys? Somebody had asked what drives you. I, I don't remember. I think it was Misfit Z or something like that. What drives you? That's pretty drives. Well, I, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. You know, like I wish I had an answer as to what drives me. I hate being lazy. Like that's a big thing with me. I was um, formerly a heroin addict. I'm a recovering heroin addict about 15 years now. And for a good period of time, I didn't do shit. Like, I didn't work. I sold drugs on the side. Like, I was just a bump on a log wasting my life. And I think back to those days where I would just sit at home all day, and, like, day would become night, night would become day. And I'm like, what the hell was I doing? So now five minutes of a day where I'm completely, like, running down the street with my hair on fire because I'm so busy, like, I feel like I'm, like, like wasting my life. You know, I think so. I think something somewhere clicked, and it was like you're wasting what you're doing, and you're wasting what you could be doing. Don't waste that. You know, there are tons of people that, you know, are in a hospital bed or they've already died. Like, what would they give to have what you have right now and have an opportunity? You know, so, like, every morning when I get up, like, I can't wait. Like, I get up, I'm like, I have one eye open on my phone like this, and I'm answering one eye open on my phone like this, and I'm answering emails before I even get out of bed. You know, like, I can't wait to get going in the morning. And I, got, I have to commend you on, on, you know, sobriety. I mean, especially that that is so hard to kick that. I live in Kentucky, Kentucky, Indiana. Uh, it, it's a real, real issue. Opiates are just yeah. one thing. One thing that I thought, I mean, not to get, get all political, but one thing that I thought was, you know, something really positive is Kratom, which I don't know if you're familiar with or not, yes. but it's, it's yeah. actually getting people off heroin. But, you know, I guess the government wants to, I guess they want to, well, make I mean, it a you know, they can't really patent Kratom and they can't make a trademark mm -hmm. out of it because it's natural. So what they wanted to just get rid of it because then you won't be on methadone and Suboxone. Like I've actually gone to um, rehab facilities myself around here in Virginia and said, here's the deal. When I was going through rehab, there wasn't a single person that succeeded that came in to talk to us. All we were told by the, the um, counselors and stuff is that we're pretty much going to fail. I was like, why? You know, like, I want to come in and donate my time, and I want to tell these people that are right now struggling, like, literally, that's where I, where I was. And here I am now as the face of Primeval at the time. You know, I had financially successful. I'm married. You know, like, everything. I own businesses. Like, all that from being a heroin addict 15 years prior and um, they kind of just blew me off. They were like, yeah, you know, we don't really need it. I'm like, you don't want somebody to donate their time. They're like, yeah, no. And I said, okay. So I kind of had to step back and think about why. And I'm like, well, let's say those people got clean off of the methadone and the, the things that they're taking. That company would go out of business. So are they really wanting people to get better like myself? Or do they really want them as a customer for life, as a legal drug addict that's on methadone or Suboxone or something? And um, I think that's what a lot of it boils down to. You know, like they don't take insurance. A lot of it is out of pocket for your, you know, your recovery and stuff. And, you know, they need to keep those numbers coming in. You know, if they don't have the people there, they're out of business. So I don't trust a lot of these, you know, these rehab facilities and stuff anymore. Like, I'm just, I've, I'm kind of like looking at it as they don't want you to be a healthy individual. They want you to be stuck with them so that they have a customer for life. Yeah. And again, uh, uh, Misfit uh, underscore 123, yeah, you're right. It's big pharma. In my opinion, it is big pharma. And actually, I know of people that have tried to get off heroin and then become addicted to methadone. It, it, it's like, yeah. it, it's yep. what, you know what I mean? And and then when it's really bad, they're taking heroin and methadone. So it's like, I, you know, so yeah. I'm, I'm on the one hand, I'm shocked they didn't want you to come in and, and, and be like, an, you know, uh, a speaker and, and, and try to help people on this. And I'm not so shocked because it's like, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, getting people better is really their priority, which is really, really sad. So, um, I think uh, just to wrap up, unless there are other questions, uh, or if there's any more. On uh, my links, everything is run through biosutraining.com. Like, I'm not going to have a separate website for GAFD Labs. GAFD Labs.com automatically directs to the BioS3 site. We're going to do a little revamping on there, and all the products are going to be sold from that one thing. But on my Instagram, Jerry Ward II, face but on my Instagram, Jerry Ward II, Facebook, Jerry Ward. Um, there's also a Facebook now, I mean, an Instagram now with um, GAFD Labs official. Um, okay. because I had people actually making fake accounts like two minutes after I announced that I was going to be doing GIFT Labs. So now we have the official one, which, you know, there's only that one. But, um, yeah, all the links, basically, if you just type in Jerry Ward in Google, like, everything will pop up. Awesome. And, and uh, Tank MCG has asked us a few times, when are the hoodies dropping? Last question. So the hoodies, so I literally have one hoodie. Like, I had one hoodie made as a friends and family thing, and I was like, wasn't too sure. But the response to the hoodie, now I'm like, you know what, I need to get some hoodies while it's still cold out because, you know, it did turn out really good. Like, I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. And I was like, wow, this is cool. But then I'm like, am I the only one that thinks this is cool? Like, does anybody else think this is cool? You know, but the response is pretty good. So I think we'll do a run of hoodies soon. But 
I've actually met Tank before. He kind of lives near me. I've met him at a show before. But as soon as they're out, Tank, keep an eye out. You're going. I got to tell you, Close is huge. Uh, our, our mutual friend, Chanel, Chanel Renee, she's got her uh, Positively Evil, which is, I, I got a shirt. I bought one. It's amazing. She's doing great shirts. And, and not to add more work to you, Jerry, but I think what would be really cool is if you did something like Daniel and Bailey did years ago where you had – you know, uh, certain T-shirts, certain hoodies, and you numbered them, and you only had a limited supply. I think I, I always thought yes. that was, like, the coolest ideas because once they're gone, they're gone. You just have to wait for the next print or the next, you know, whatever. So I thought that was pretty cool. Nobody does that, but just an yeah, idea. Yeah, I've actually looked um, – because there's actually a lot of my um, followers and viewers are into, like, the sneakerhead stuff too. So there's certain sneakers, like, in the sneakerhead community that you get the shirt to kind of match the sneakers. You wear a pair of jeans with, like, a matching shirt. And I was like, you know what? You know, I'm kind of fiddling around with doing, like, exclusive runs – specifically for the sneakerheads, you know, GFD shirts that'll match the sneakers themselves, limited edition hoodies, limited edition hats, you know, stuff like that. But we're only like literally 15 together. Like it's literally two weeks that I'm into this. So it's like everything is moving at light speed and, um, you know, like, and, um, you know, like I'm just having a hard time holding on to the roller coaster at this point. Hashtag slow down. No, I know what you're saying, but this is like, <laughs> I'm sure. And again, uh, the people love you. You know, I mean, they're, I'm, I'm really happy you're going to be at the Arnold. Hopefully, you can stop by the Muscle Jaws booth and say hello to me, and definitely Greg Valentino. Frank, that'd be awesome. And uh, guys, if you see Jerry at the Arnold Classic, you know, say hello to him. Say what's up. He wants you to say hello. What's up? And again, Jerry, thank you so much for all of those Instagram lives you do. It's like it feels like you just pull over and just do an impromptu live, and you try to answer every question. Nobody does that. I mean, like nobody yeah, does. Yeah, I actually that. do it. When, I, I do it when I'm driving. I'm actually not pulled over. I'm actually driving when I do it, which people kind of give me shit for. But like, I can't sit in a car. Like, I feel like I'm wasting time, and that's why I started doing it. So well, instead of wasting time, literally sitting in this car with the radio on like this, because there's a lot of traffic where I live, so there's a lot mm -hmm. of stop and go. Like, I can just grab. So when the car is stopped or whatever, or whatever, or speak my mind or whatever. But I like doing the live things because I like doing the live things because it's not. I'm not good with rehearsed. You know what I mean? That's why if I do an interview, the people are like, hey, shoot them off, you know, while we're on there. Yeah, the first time that we've spoken. So, I mean, hopefully not last, but that's great. I love it like that, too. Just off the cuff and just real. So, Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. For Jerry Ward, Christian Duke, strengthaddicts.com. Thanks for having me, Christian. I appreciate it, man.